Uh, yeah, so we're in the middle of this series called Crossing Over, and I'm going to endeavour to keep this morning uh, as short as possible. We aim to finish by about quarter past 12, so if, ever, if I get a bit quick, you know, just bear with me in what I'm saying, but um, I've got some stuff here that I, that I believe is relevant to you, and um, this part of the Crossing Over series is crossing over from past to present, and I think the best messages that a preacher can give are those that are relevant to people right where they are. And I would say, I would hazard a guess that there probably isn't any one person in this place that can't point to something in their past that is something that they have struggled with, something that they're struggling with, something that affects them even now. We can't help but but, uh, uh, refer back to things that have happened in the past hurts that we've gone through, things that we've done, and not relay those, we'll relate those to our current situation. And I think one of the most saddest parts of the Israelite story is, is the fact that they had to go round and round that desert for 40 years. Yeah. And we use that as an illustration often about a desert time, a desert experience, about the difficult time they went through. And I'm sure it really was difficult. Living in a desert can't be easy, but they had to go round and round, and round, and round. And this is what we do if we're not careful. When it comes to our past, we live as if we're going round, and round, and round, unless we choose to deal with the issue and move from living in a past situation to living for a future. And you'll have heard this saying before, because it's pretty well known, a guy called George... Santayana, I think that's how you pronounce it, he's a Spanish philosopher, poet, novelist, and he said something along these lines, it's been changed over time, but those who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. And so today, my mission this morning is to try and bring us to a point where we're able to live lives that are not dictated to by our past. Um, I've been thinking about David as I was um, thinking about preparing this message. Uh, David in the Bible, obviously. And um, there's a part in, in 1 Samuel 16 where David is chosen to be king. That's pretty amazing. Um, I mean, what a great day. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine that waking up, going to work, coming from work? Hey, you're going to be king. That would be a pretty good day in, in the grand scheme of things. But, but actually, there's a bit of a bittersweetness to that story because David wasn't even acknowledged. He wasn't even um, put forward as a candidate. In fact, he was seen as being so insignificant that he wasn't even brought to the table. He wasn't even brought to the queue to be considered. The way the story is told, Samuel comes to, because he's been told by God to go visit Jesse, the household of Jesse, and he asks Jesse, can I see your sons? Because God sent me to choose the future king of Israel. And so Jesse says, yes, yeah, sure. And he brings out every single son apart from David. David's left looking after the sheep. And as you probably know how the story goes, that, that Samuel goes down each and every single one of Jesse's sons and he looks at them, and especially the first one, he looks and he thinks, this is a kingly guy. This, is, this guy looks like he should be a king. But God says, no, not that one. And he goes, gradually goes down and down the queue until he gets to the end and, and he says, has to say to Jesse, there must be somebody else. And Jesse says, well, yeah, there's my last son, my youngest son, David, but he's not even here. The reason why that stood out to me in that scenario is that David couldn't pick his place in the queue. And you can't pick your place. You can't pick the things that have happened in your life, you can't choose to not go through the things that you are going through and have been through. You can't go back in time and undo the things that you've done. You can't pick your place in the queue. But what I love about David was that even though even his, his own father and his brothers didn't even see any potential in him, at least when it came to being a king, that David didn't act any differently when he came to tending the sheep. In fact, at times, 
The Bible tells us that when David was tending and looking after the sheep, that a wolf or a lion or a bear would come by. And David didn't stand there and say, I'm insignificant. He didn't stand there and say, I'm not kingly like my brothers. No, what he did was he said, I will stand up and I will fight to defend what is mine. And when it came to facing a, a giant, when the entire nation was stood by, afraid, he was, was the one who stood up and said, no, I will, I will uh, deal with this giant. I will fight this battle for my nation. And you see, God saw the king inside of David. He might have smelt like the sheep, but God saw the king in him. Psalm 78, verses 70 to 72 says that he, God, chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him out to be a shepherd of his people, Jacob of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart, with skillful hands, he led them. And so whatever situation you are in right now, however you think other people view you right now, whatever your past is, I came here to tell you this morning, God can take you out of your sheep pen and he can make you a king. You might feel like you are insignificant in your sheep pen. You may feel like the things in your past are dictating to you right now. The insecurities that you have right now may be based upon things that have happened to you. People may have hurt you. People may have betrayed you. You may have betrayed other people. You may have been injured. You may have been ill. But the Bible says this about you. Leviticus 26 verse 8. That if just five of you Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall by the sword. He tells a story of Gideon, who God takes just 300 people and defeats an entire army. The Bible says about you that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. So you might not have a big bank balance, but you can have a big vision for your future. You might not, you don't have to be in a church with a big building. To have a big vision for your future. You don't have to be in a, have a big crowd following you for a big vision for your future. Amen. You don't have to be in a church that has carpets to have a big vision for your future. You just need to recognize that however, you're small, however small your sheep pen is, God is bigger. And he will pull you out and he will set you up. Because what he has decided for your life will come to pass. So I want to I just look, um, take the rest of this message uh, from Philippians 3. I want to break down part of this uh, passage, but I'm going to read a few more verses for it. So we're going to start from Philippians 3 verse 12. And it says this, Not that I have already obtained this, or have already been made perfect, but I Press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. And this is the key part for today's message. Forgetting what is behind I, and striving towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. My first point is this. Choose what you remember. You may not realize this, but feelings are more easily remembered than the things that cause the feelings. So maybe you can relate to this. Maybe there's somebody that you don't get on with very well. And maybe when you see them, you're like... When they're walking past you, you're like, I don't think you make maybe make that noise, but but like in, internally you're like, hmm. Something about them. And, and if and if you I mean you shouldn't do this anyway, because you were Christians, right? We don't gossip. But if you ever try to explain to somebody what it is that you maybe don't like about a person, you find it really hard because you're thinking, actually, I can't remember what it was they did. But I just know that they did loads of it and it really upset me. And so sometimes you can go like years having negative feelings towards somebody, and you can't even remember why it was because you feel longer than you remember uh, when it comes to you know, remembering the actions of what someone's done. 
And they made you feel a certain way but that you didn't like, but you can't even remember why. But those feelings are there. But here's the thing. We have to be very careful what we choose to remember. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. If you want to cross over from your past to your future, you need to learn to forget. It says, forgetting what is behind. You know, sometimes Leah will ask me to pop to the shop, and uh, I will go to the shop, and she will give me a, a list of stuff verbally that I have to buy. I won't lie to you. I'm not very good at remembering st- everything. I can pretty much guarantee I'll come back missing one thing. In fact, some items I intentionally miss because they're not things that men should have to buy. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, so, <laughs> so <laughs> you know, cleaning material I'm talking about, obviously. So, uh, so I come home, and Leah's like, where's the... And I'm like... I forgot. <laughs> I'm sorry. I forgot. You know, we have to learn to forget some things sometimes. He- Hebrews 10 verse 14 to 17 says that for by one sacrifice he has, been, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Some of you are punishing yourself for things that God has already forgiven. Some of you are holding yourself in a prison that you were never meant to be in. God has already forgotten the things that you have done. If you've asked for his forgiveness and believe in faith that he died on the cross for your sins, it's done, it's dealt with. We have to forget it. Because God himself isn't even remembering it. You can be praying to God, God, I'm so sorry. And God's like, what for? You already apologized once. I can't remember what it was that you did. Romans 8 verse 1 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who were in Christ Jesus. You know, we cut that verse a lot. I look what was before that verse. I thought it's interesting sometimes to know the context of where someone's coming from. That's a great verse on its own. But if you look at the verses before that verse, what Paul is saying is, is the things that I want to do, I, I don't do. The things I know I should. And the things that I, I know I shouldn't do, I do do. He's saying, I keep messing up. In fact, he calls himself wretched. He says all that, and then he says, but there's no condemnation in Christ. We have to learn to forget some things. Forget what's behind. You know, Jesus even said once to somebody, get behind me, Satan. That's where Satan lives. He is behind us, he is under us. And we need to forget the things that are behind. But the Bible also says, though, that we are to remember In Deuteronomy 8 verse 2, it says, Remember that for 40 years the Lord your God led you on your journey in the desert. You see, the Israelites may have remembered the fear, the uncertainty. They may have remembered the lack of food or lack of variety of food. They may have remembered the sand. But God wanted to make sure they remembered it was him who led them all that time. In Joshua 4 verse 20 to 22, it says, Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones he had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, What do these stones mean? Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. He's done it before, so he can do it again. I've seen him move. He moved the mountains. And I believe I'll see him do it again. We have to forget and put behind us the things that we don't need, the things that are are part of our past that God has forgiven us for that we can move on from. But we have to remember the things, the miracles and the blessings that God's given us. You have to forget the hurts, but remember the miracles. And I'm sure that you're probably sitting here today thinking to yourself, that sounds really simple, Luke. You know, I've been getting it mixed up all this time. I've been remembering the hurts and forgetting the miracles. But actually, yeah, that's what we do. We remember the hurts and we forget the miracles. I know that in, in, in a year's time, 
will have moved on from this sense that we have right now. I don't know how you feel, but when I'm in this building every single Sunday, I can sense the faith in here because of people have seen what God has done. Yeah. But in a year's time from now, will you still have that faith? We have to remember what God's done for us. Every day is Remembrance Day when it comes to the blessings and the miracles of God. I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a coincidence that in Joshua 1, God puts together, he tells Joshua to be strong and courageous. And at the same time, he says, meditate on my word. I don't think that's a coincidence that he puts strength and courage right side by side with meditating on God's word. We have to remember God's promises, remember what he's done for us. So that's the first battle, and it's for your mind. And just like David didn't let his situation, didn't let the fact that his brothers and his father uh, thought less of him, he didn't let that count him out, don't let your thoughts count you out. Second point I want to make today is that we are to push back the darkness. It says forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal. I need some help for this, this, this part. I need, I need three blokes. So Andy, Joel, Brad, come on up. So when you were a child, when you were a kid in the playground at school, maybe you had this, this happen to you. I don't know. Okay, but if ever you were stood in a crowd of people, and uh, um, Brad, you're the most humble, obviously, so stand in the middle. I was going to ask, who of you is the most humble? But then obviously no one would, would, would say. So, um, don't know if you, yeah, get out of the way. We're going to need that out of the way. Okay. So, um, you're in a crowd of people. So, Brad, stand in the middle for me, mate, and Joel and Andy stand behind. There we go. If you were in a crowd of, of this definitely for boys, right, and you just, you know, bumped into somebody, you can guarantee what happened is they'd go back, and then the person behind them would what? What would they do, lads? What would, what would, if Brad kind of stumbled into you, what would you do? Exactly right. Now, you could be all day, because all of a sudden, it only takes a few little pushes, it becomes a game. So they're like that, and they're going all over the place like this, and you've only got one way to get out of this situation, right? Oh, don't take it too far, lads, come on. <laughs> you've, only got, you've only got one way to get out of this situation, and that's, what do you, what, what do you reckon? No. No, you can sit down. The only way for Brad to get out of this situation is for Brad to push back. He could stand there and wait until the guy stopped pushing, but I've been in the middle of the little circle, and it can go on for ages, far longer than, than you actually want it to go on for. And so the only real way to get out of that situation is to push someone out of the way and get out of it. Thanks, lads, that was it. You did great. Rewards in heaven, well done. Um, we have to push back. The first point is all about your thoughts, about taking your thoughts captive. This point is all about your actions. What are you pushing for? What are you straining for? Or are you allowing yourself to be pushed from side to side? You're, the, the devil's there and he's pushing you this way, saying, remember what you did? You've got the enemy on this side pushing you saying, remember what that person did to you. You've got this person over here saying, remember how you felt. Remember how you, you, your dad was never there for you. You can't be a good dad, pushing him back. You've got this enemy over here pushing him, saying, you remember how uh, you look in the mirror and you look at yourself and you think, ah, I, I just don't look good. And, and you, can't, you can't be on stage. You can't speak to that person. You can't relate to that person. You can't share Jesus with that person. You can't do that. You can't do this. You can't be that. The devil wants to push you left, right, and center. You've got to push back. That's why we strain towards what is ahead. If you want to cross over from your past to your future, you're going to have to do some pushing. Phil mentioned last week about a revolution. What comes before revolution is revelation. The revelation is the understanding. And that comes with the, our first point about guarding your, your thoughts, but every revolution prece is preceded by a revelation. You have to understand, but then you have to act. 
I don't ever want to be the type of Christian who has a good understanding of what the Bible means, but then actually doesn't live that out in my everyday life. Some of you aren't eager. You need to get eager. Some of you aren't leaning forward in your chair for the word of God. You aren't hungry to read your Bible. This is how we push forward. You aren't bothered in your worship. You know, sometimes I stand at the back of the room just to get a, a feel of, of, of the worship and the place and to see how people are at. You know, I won't lie to you. Sometimes I get a little bit frustrated and disappointed. Let me tell you the church I want to be a part of. I want to see a church that is passionate about worshiping God. I want to see a church where there's people all over with arms raised high, lost in worship and adoration of their God. That's a church I want to be a part of. But you've got to learn to push. We've got to push back the enemy. We've got to show him, I am going to worship. No matter what you might say about me, no matter what you're whispering in my ear right now, I choose to take that thought captive and I choose to push back the kingdom of darkness. If you want to cross over from your past to your future that God has for you, he, he's saying to you this morning, serve, listen, worship, learn, love, push back the darkness, break through in your life. Matthew 5 verse 16 says that in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. John 1 verse 5 says that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has to overcome it. If you want to cross over from your past to your future, you've got to push back the darkness. Is that the time? I've got 18 minutes over there, but I've got three minutes on my watch. <laughs> so I'm going to move on. If you want to push back, the first thing, and I'll just leave you with this on this point, is you have to learn to stand on solid ground. You can't push back unless you're basing your life on solid ground. I don't know whether you um, had the same experience as me, but tug of war games when you were like doing sports day at school and stuff. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a weak person. I'm fairly strong. And, it, and what I find, though, is, is tug of war games are often not based upon how strong I am, but how much grip I have in my legs. And so the number of times I have held the rope and I haven't budged my muscles haven't moved. I haven't kind of let it go that way. I'm staying still, but yet I'm moving because my feet are slipping on the grass. You are only as strong as the, the ground that you are basing yourself in. We have to learn to stand on solid ground. Psalm 62 verses 6 to 8 in the Message Bible says, Message Version says, He's solid rock under my feet, breathing room for my soul, an impregnable castle, I'm set for life, my help and glory are in God, so trust him absolutely people, lay your lives on the line for him, God is a safe place to be. Psalm 40 verse 2 says that he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire and set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand, so I'm not uncertain I'm sure. I'm not insecure. I'm secure. I'm not fearful. I'm as bold as a lion. I'm not meaningless. I have purpose. I'm not a loser. I'm on the victorious team. I'm not shrinking back because my feet are on solid ground and I'm pushing back. Amen? Yeah. Amen. I don't know about black American churches, but I, I, like, I like feedback. Yeah. I think we should be a church that is vocal about what we believe. Hey, if you can't do it in here, you'll never do it out there. So if you believe it, speak it. My last point is this. Live for the prize. Live for the prize. So forgetting what is behind and straining to what is ahead, I press on towards what? The goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. There was a time before Leah and I uh, were together, when we were still classed as single, where I admired her from afar. And I know. And um, until one day, a conversation was had. 
Leah instigated the conversation because she was, you know, obviously attracted to me <laughs> greatly. <laughs> I'm not ashamed to say that. But uh, I remember that conversation being had. And I remember, and I, I, you know, I, I, am, I, I like to think I'm a manly man. Uh, I like my meat as raw as possible. Um, I like to watch manly films. I'm a manly man. But I pretty much skipped home that day. Uh, I was giddy. And uh, I was so excited. Why? Because the person that I had admired from afar, all of a sudden, I'd, I'd won the prize, if you know what I mean. I'd got what my heart's desire wanted. What you may or may not know is that you have a prize. You have a prize. Second Timothy 2 verse 5 says that also if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. So there is a prize that you are competing for. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says that without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So how earnestly you seek him will determine what your reward is. Are there any uh, firstborns here? Anyone who's number one in the children? Okay. You will have probably had the same thing said to you when all you, all you and your brothers and sisters were in trouble. Um, you may be able to complete this sentence. I don't know. Um, you should know better because because you're the oldest, right? So actually, there's a verse that says in James 3 verse 1 that not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. So actually, even t- if you are teaching the word of God, the Bible says that you will be judged more strictly. So therefore, that your reward will have an even greater criteria. So, so there is definitely a sense that we have a reward... That on this earth, the things we do affects. Now, I can hear some of you probably already thinking, what you're trying to say here, Luke. I'm not for one minute saying that that your salvation is dependent on your actions. The Bible is really, really clear about this. Um, It says in... Hold on a second while I find it. It says, for by the grace you have... It is by grace you have been saved... Through faith, and this is not from yourself, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Your salvation is not dependent on your actions. That is that is true. But your reward is. Matthew six, verse nineteen says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy. So you can you can actually store up. It's your heavenly pension scheme. You are storing treasures up in heaven. Every time you act in a way that is godly, every time you act in a way that is moving the kingdom forward, every time you are obedient to Christ, you are storing up for yourself a reward in heaven. So so what I'm trying to put across to you today is it's not in your best interest to sit back and relax. It's not in your best interest to not live the life God is calling you to live. You can do literally do nothing, just believe you are saved and get into heaven. But the Bible says this about that in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 14 to 15, that if what he has built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is built up, sorry, burned up, the builder will suffer loss but yet will be saved even though one, only as one escaping through the flames. So if what we do on this life counts as nothing, then we'll get into heaven, but like we'll get in there by the skin of our teeth is what it's saying. We have to live for the prize. If you want to be taken out of living a life that is based in your past and live a life that is, that is what you're called to live, the future God has for you, you have to know the prize. You have to live 
for the prize. You have to live as if competing for the prize. But here's the good news. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. Hebrews 13 verse 20 to 21 says that now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep equip you with everything good for doing his will and may he work in you what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 to 17 All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the good news is this. You will have everything you need to do what God's called you to do and to live the future he's calling you to live. You'll have everything you need to earn your reward. But you've got to keep the prize in mind. The first battle was for how you think. Don't let your thoughts count you out of your freedom. The second battle was for, for what you do. Don't let your actions count you out of maturing. But the third battle for the prize is about who you will become. Don't let your personal desires count you out of your prize Um, this week's been half term and so um, we've had it's it's been nice, the kids have been out playing and and those of you who know us um, or have heard us say before, we moved house recently and so the kids have been having fun recently playing hide and seek in the house and uh, over the holiday they've been playing hide and seek quite a bit and uh, it's been nice um, that the, the neighborhood's kids seem to have invaded our house as well. So they're all playing hide and seek all over the place. And, uh, but I, I felt like God tell me to tell you this week as I was preparing that some of you are hiding. Some of you, when it comes to your life, you're hiding in your hurts. You're hiding in your pain. You're hiding in your shame and your guilt You're hiding in the things that other people have said about you. And what I find really interesting about what the the Bible tells us in Genesis about about when Adam and Eve Eve, um, sinned for the first time. They went and they hid. But God, when he was looking for him, wasn't walking around saying, what have you done? What have you done? What he said to him is, why are you hiding? God knew exactly what they'd done, and he knew exactly where they were, and God knows exactly what you've done. He knows exactly what's been done to you. But I felt like God asked me, asked me to this week to ask some of you, why are you hiding? And the funny thing is about playing hide and seek is you can't hide and seek at the same time. You need to seek God. You need to push back. You need to press on this morning. Stop hiding in your past and believe in the future God has called you to. Amen. Amen. Let's just pray and then we'll finish. Father, I thank you for this morning, for gathering us together. And I pray, Lord, that we will leave today inspired and determined to live the life you have called us to live. To accept our past is our past but that you are the God that pulls us out of our sheep pens and you are the God that places us in a throne, ruling and reigning alongside you, Father. Let us be the kings and queens you've called us to be in this life. Let us live a life that is fighting for that prize, Father. And Father, we we believe, as you've done it before, you will do it again. And we believe that you are going to do miraculous things in this church in the lives of the people here and in this area and in Sheffield. In Jesus' name, we claim it. We declare it to every principality and power that you have no right to us or this place. And we are excited to see what God's going to do. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.